Welcome back to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes and today I'm joined by Jim Orr and Brian Degnan. It's the Axon Built and it's Friday and it's pre-match day as well. Um, after this, I'll be travelling through to Glasgow, ladies and gents, where I'll be joined on stage at eight o'clock tonight by Brian McClare, also known as Chalky, Chocaldino um, and Chocrates. Any other chocolate style names, throw them in the comments section for my intro tonight. Jim and Brian, how are you doing, lads? Great, top draw. Happy it's Friday, looking forward to the weekend. Can I complain? Yeah, mm, good. Uh, what about yourself, mm. Jim? I'm still choked <laughs> up with this cold. I can't get rid of it. Like three months now. In the last two games, have they helped? That's like mm. still trying to throw out for Wednesday night. That's one of the coldest games ever was Wednesday night. Really freezing cold. But anyway, apart yeah. from that. Apart from that, you know the coldest games of football I have ever attended, right? One of them was at Oakville View. It was Stenhouse Moor against Alloa. And there was a tiny wee bit of um, kind of like roofed section. And it was mm. leaking. It was leaking like a sieve. Everybody in the stadium tried to go under this, right? So actually, mm. whilst you were there, it felt like no bad atmosphere, even though mm. there was 300 people in the ground. And mm. the other coldest day I've ever experienced was actually I went for a, uh, to a game featuring, um, was it Oviedo? Osasuna. It was Osasuna, and it was in Spain. And it was the coldest game of football I've ever watched, Brian. So there you go. One in Scotland, one in Spain. Um, I was Pop star life still you have? Pop yes. You have. I know, both games probably span something like 23 years. It's not like I'm, you know, Nat Natasha Meeklin it all around oh, the world, oh, you know? Well, you can't put a Meekle. That's, that's, no. that's really... That's a, that's a top level, isn't it? Me, me Claire, just to pull you Oh, up. I like Claire. that. I, I've not been out of the country in, oh, let me think now, four years? I've not been out of the country in four years. That sounds like you've been tagged, the way you said that there. <laughs> yes, I know, but we weren't meant to talk about that, <laughs> if only, if only. <laughs> During the week there, as part of the prep, I nipped into Gracie's, which is the venue for tonight's event with Brian McClare. And on the wall, prominently in the bar, Jim, was your bend it like Bertie, poster before we start talking about Celtic what's happening tomorrow tell us where we can find tickets for Bender Like Bertie well Bender Like Bertie is on just less than three weeks time at Pavilion Theatre in Glasgow uh, there's only balcony seats left uh, it's on a Thursday night Friday night Saturday night and a Saturday afternoon matinee so the wonderfully funny Des McLean so if you haven't seen it even if you have seen it Try and get come them back, on. absolutely. Come back. And, come back. and I was Please reading it was just the balcony seats that were available for the just the balcony nights. seats for the for all nights, yeah. Brilliant, superb. Um, and obviously, we will be sharing links uh, to everyone on our mailing list as well. What's your comments? Bring them in. John Barnes is trying to line up Ange Postecoglou for a job in the EPL, um, along with four of our star players. I'm going to start off with that before we get into the nitty gritty of League Cup finals and Scottish Cup games against Morton. Now. Brian, as you know, John Barnes appeared on a Celtic State of Mind. It was something of a controversial interview, I've got to say. It was a while back. It was when we were just doing the, the audio. Um, and actually, I did it on StreamYard, but I did it as a pre-record, which worked out pretty well because a few of the sections had to be edited. <coughs> um, and I was trying to find that recently because, you know, if, if I could find it, I would have fired it up on the YouTube channel. Can't find that, but the audio file is certainly up there. And as I say, uh, he pulled no punches that day. But I think he's kind of wide of the mark. He's linking Ange Postacoglu to West Ham United. And he's also of the view that four of our players could live in the EPL. Kyogo, Iota, Maeda and Hatati. So what do you make of all that chat? Well, first of all, I think that <coughs> linking Ange with Premier League jobs has is, is been something of a staple in the media, whether it's been pundits, the, the press getting excited. I get the feeling in terms of Ange, he's one of those guys that, I mean, I don't know him personally, obviously, but he seems driven more by success and legacy than by, you know, pounds and pence. And I think that he would rather achieve something and leave his legacy at Celtic and then move, as opposed to jump to a Brendan Rodgers and sort of jump ship to the to the EPL. Um, if he was to go, you'd have to question, would he get the time? Now, obviously, when he came to Celtic, he got the time, but it was a, a rocky start. But you have to understand, even although it was a rocky start, we still had enough players in the squad that were better than almost everyone else in the league. So that did help, obviously. If we need to say a West Ham, would they get a couple of months of maybe changing the systems, get his own players against that sort of opposition in that league? I'm not sure. And I think he would probably be thinking, 
You know, I think he would back himself as he always does, but would it be a great fit? I'm not 100 sure. So um, I think unless it's a he achieves something great with Celtic, which I believe he will, um, I don't see him going anywhere. Um, in terms of the players, unusual choices um, mm. about who would fit in the Premier League. I, I always think that it's not just about being a, a, a good player, it's a certain type of physicality you need. Yeah. So I think Matt O'Reilly would be the most suited. Or, I know even a David Turnbull, actually, because you know, big, strong midfielders with a bit of mobility and that passing. Hitati would probably do all right. Um, Maeda is a strange one. Um, would he be a, a Premier League class winger? I'm not sure. Um, but he's missed the guys like Callum McGregor. Stop, but... Brian. Brian, Brian, stop. You're selling all the players. Stop. No, no, no. Stop. Stop. Yeah, no, listen, no, what, what about Carter none, Vickers? None of them's going. None Where's Carter Vickers going? If anybody's watching this, if there's any Premier League chairman's watching this and listening James to James McCarthy, that's the guy you want. Eddie Gucci, yeah. McCarthy, and Abel Gar. What about that's they two? The they can go. They can go. <laughs> They're the best players in the squad, Jim. You're right. Now, on the subject of Maeda, though, um, I, I'm a big fan of Maeda. I think he's he's really performed so well after the World Cup in particular, Brian. But it's, it kind of strikes me as, and no disrespect to John Barnes, he's down south, he's obviously focusing on the EPL more than the Scottish League. But it, it, it strikes me as though he doesn't really have the knowledge of what's happening at Celtic. I mean, the four players he's, he's picked out are fantastic footballers. But if you were to say who are the four star men in the Celtic team right now, um, and I know that's a different question because the question is who could play in the EPL. Maeda, of course, was was linked to Southampton. Um, I, I just think, you know, it's almost as if we've got a settled team. Let's throw a wee cat amongst the pigeons. Um, that, that's what it feels like to me when I read that type of thing, Jim. I mean, I was on last, the last time I was on, someone took exception in the comments. I used the word mince because I said I get taught mince, basically. So, so mince compared to people who know what they're talking about. And by that, I mean people who are in the know. And mince to me is another word for uninformed opinions. And that's all Barnes is doing. It's an uninformed opinion. He's flown a kite here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This guy's doing no bad in Scotland. He could do well in England. Aye, I know he could. Here's four players. Here's 10 players that could do really well down there. You know, it's just uninformed opinion. Mm -hmm. Someone flying a kite. And it's something that we could do without. And, uh, and I know that's what we do. I mean, 99% of us don't know what's happening. And that's the fun of giving our uninformed opinions about things like that. And, and yeah, I mean... We've got a lot of really good players and we've got a really good manager who could who could do well in, in any league in the world, not just the EPL. And it's this arrogance that that's the next step, you know. And I'm not going to say anything more other than that. You know, Ange could go to any country in the world. Ange could go to Spain, take one of the big Spanish teams, you know. He doesn't yeah. have to go down south, you know. And that's the arrogance of the EPL is everyone wants to come here. No, they don't. And Ange is too clever for that. I think. I think Ange enjoys what he's doing just now. I thought if we kept Ange for about three years, we'd be, we'd be, we'd be doing quite well. So we're halfway into that. I don't expect Ange to leave. Uh, the players, on the other hand, are a completely different thing. Uh, money talks, and you know, the last couple of weeks we talked about Yakimakis and Juranovic and all that kind mm -hmm, of stuff. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's just about money. It's not about whether somebody's a good player or not. They're all, if you're playing for Celtic's first team, you're a good player. If you're playing in Champions League and you, and you and you acquit yourself quite well, then you're a good player. And if you see some of the players who are playing down south, you might wonder, how did they manage to get into their team? They're not as good as what we've got up here. So to me, it's an obvious fact that we've got a number of players who would do well in that league and other leagues, and we've got a manager who would do well. Mm -hmm. But John Barnes, you know, he's pretty much yesterday's man, is he not? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, the point you made, Brian, in terms of how quickly your stock drops down south. Um, case in point, the current manager of West Ham United, with regards to David Moyes and the way that West Ham United fans were reacting to there, it was the start of this season, wasn't it? And and everybody was going on about, this guy's an absolute mastermind. A few months down the line, different story. So yes, the stock rises and drops dramatically well, down south. Deal. When he was in the Premier League, obviously we asked him, Billy, done tremendous. Then they had a sort of ropey season. Then he got the Sunderland job. That wasn't it. Didn't he go great? And then suddenly he's <coughs> light off and he's going to a Premier League job. Mm -hmm. it's, it's so quick to turn around. You, and I think with Moise, he's almost made a rod for his own back by having a good season because unless you can top it, you're guaranteed to top it. You're in hiding to nothing. It's not a... I don't think it's a league for a manager to make a huge name for himself. I think it's almost a league where managers who are already a big name can go and get a bash. 
Big thing. I also well, watch the other way as well, guys. That that, that there's a story during the week about uh, Arteta at Arsenal, uh, mm-hmm. and the Arsenal fans were wanting him out this time last year. Yeah. And the story was about they played. Was it was it, was it Chelsea? They played. Whoever they played when Jose Mourinho was the manager of the opposition, and Arsenal get gubbed, and Mourinho came out and said, "Give this guy a couple of years. The way he's trying to shape his team, he'll do really well, and he'll be really good." Because Mourinho is in the know, he kind of knows what he's talking about, you know. But this time last year, Arsenal fans get rid of him. They're sitting there, was it eight points clear in the league? Fantastic chance of winning the league. Football's fickle. Always been fickle. Yeah, and you know we might we might actually get Kieran Tierney back on a short term loan to be back up to Greg Taylor as well, Brian. So that that would be interesting if that develops. Celtic follower, you're on YouTube. I'm on time today for once after all. So were we, I think. I think we were. I hope we were. Twelve thirty. Thanks for joining us on the YouTube channel. If you haven't done so already, get subscribing on there because uh, just earlier on this week we gave away a couple of tickets for Brian McClure tonight at Gracie's. We are going to be joined by Lloyd Jepson, whose name has popped up so often on this channel. You get to think that you know these people, and thankfully, when we do the live gigs, you will be able to meet a few of the regular contributors. So afternoon, everyone. I don't know much about. We've decided we're calling them O because Ki Sung Young, we called him Ki, all right? Um, but going by his stats, he could be a very good player for us. Also looking forward to this evening at Gracie's. So am I, Lloyd, and come and say hello. I will probably be running about uh, mad tonight, but come along and say hello. Martin Clark um, is watching in sunny Dublin as well. Keep the comments coming in. I asked the question during the week, who are we going to replace Yakimakis with? The man's not out the door yet. So we'll start off with Yakimakis. Um, he was arrested due to um, having a slight injury the other night, according to Ange, and I believe everything Ange tells me, so that's fine. Um, and we will talk about the impressive display against St Mirren. But what's your thoughts at the moment with Yakimakis? Where are we here? Let's have a wee look. So we're on the 20th of January, 11 days to go in the transfer window. Yakimakis is still our player. And, um, you know, when you look at the amount of names, and I know Celtic are linked a lot with players, there's quite a lot of names being linked because I don't think he's going to be easy to replace if he does leave, Brian. No, I think so. I, 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 I've liked Jack Marcus for the start, and actually quite a few things have championed him to start over Kyogo for certain games. Yeah. I know I think he's necessarily a better player or a better striker. I, I don't, but I think certain games suit him. I think he's something different. I love his attitude. You know, and even when he's came on, you know, he, he, I love the fact that he gets frustrated, but he gets frustrated with himself. He doesn't throw arms up and start blaming everybody else. He's got a real winning mentality. He's got a great goal scoring record. Um, I think the, the key thing is, as I mentioned before when I was talking about him, is we don't really know. Well, first of all, we don't know if he actually wants to leave, right? But that's just at the moment, it's just paper talk. Ange keeps rubbish on it. If he does, we don't know why. If it's to get more money and mean they're willing to give him it, I can sort of understand he probably wants to stay. But as to think of his family. Regardless of whether he gets paid 10, 15, 20, 30 grand, if he can get double that somewhere else, the guy's going to probably take it, right? If he's genuinely unhappy and wants to go, then yeah, we need to sell him. So I think there's a lot of it. Ange talked about it when he spoke about people criticising his lineups, and he yeah. says most people will know 10% of what I know about the squad and the players and the lineups and why we've made these choices. Um, and I think that's the same with Yakimakis. So if, if it's for any other reason, then he wants to leave. I would, I would definitely try and keep him. Um, I think he's a real asset. I think he, he just gives you something different. And I think the the dynamic of you know, Kyogo and him rotating. Say you've been marking Yakimakis for an hour, and then Kyogo comes on. That's a nightmare. And the same vice versa. Um, and you know, although Angie's transfer record is stellar, you, you're always going to have a question mark when you bring somebody else in, especially when it's been this length of time, which is a little bit unusual in your Ange. Um, so a few question marks at the moment. Um, I'd be happy for him to stay, but it does depend on the reasons and only him and Ange know that. Yeah, definitely. I'm going to bring this comment up before I come to you, Jim. I know that you're um, braving a, a niggly cold there, so we do appreciate it. But K Matsu has been in the, the comments on the YouTube, not always live, but I have read your comments and they are appreciated on the YouTube channel. Good grief, more rumours. For what it's worth, I personally think, oh, as a solid finisher... And it would be a clever signing. But all my Korean contacts think he will wait till summer. And this is just another wind-up. The reason I'm bringing this up is because it's going back to what Jim says in terms of source um, and how strong the sources are. Um, 
and when we're talking about the Japanese link, I like to speak to Liam for obvious reasons. He's based in Japan, and he can give us the idea of what the chat is over there. And he has quashed quite a few of the rumours, Liam, in relation to um, even Yakimakis moving over there. So it is appreciated when K Matsu comes in with a bit of info. Um, yes, we do appreciate that it could well just be another wild rumour. Going back to something that Anne said the other week there in relation to the amount of the players being linked to Celtic and knows who they are interested in, and you know, and the disparity between those two. Um, when you're looking at Yakimakis, though, Jim, I've mentioned a couple of times, I, I really like him. Yes, I think there is a, a simple fact that he gives you something different. Definitely, you notice that. But in terms of his versatility, it works against him or, or, or his lack of, you know, Kyogo can come on and play wide, as most of the forward players can, but Yakimakis doesn't have that in his locker, and it means he's getting a wee bit less game time, which you obviously is frustrated with, Jim. What do we do with a player like Yakimakis at this point? I think it's an interesting one. There's a lot of subplots within the Yakimakis story, uh, getting back to talking mints again, that we don't really know what's happening. We don't know why he wants to go. We don't know what his contract looks like, and that was the thing about... When Juranovic and Yakimakis a few weeks ago, people were like, like, like losing their losing their heads over this. We demand, we get twenty million pounds. We insist. We blah, 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 blah. and it could be a clause in his contract that says it can go for X, which is only five million or something like that. So we're all getting worked up about things that we don't know how it's going to pan out. Why does he want to leave? That's a kind of subplot t- t- to me. A concern I have is the fact that. I mean, the Hamden pitch was, was, was awful last week. Mm-hmm. The Celtic Park pitch wasn't too clever the other night. And what I noticed last week uh, for the first, well, not for the first time, but where I sit at Celtic Park, behind the goals, uh, last Saturday I was in the North Stand, so I was quite close to the pitch, although I, was, <laughs> I, was, uh, I wasn't wet, I was kept out of the wet, but I was quite close to the park. And when you're that close to the park, you can see how difficult it is to make all the passes that, that we actually make. Mm during the game, and we make hundreds, whatever, seven, eight hundred passes a game on a difficult surface. So if the pitches are going to be worse, we need a big centre forward because our game is all about pass, 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 pass. And if the surfaces aren't too clever, that's going to be, you know, that's going to work to our disadvantage, I think. So I mean, rivals, I know what that, I mean, rivals ping high diagonal balls and crossing the box. So we need a big centre forward. Whether he plays all the time or not, I don't know. But if Yakimakis leaves, we certainly need one coming in. But there's so many subplots about the Yakimakis story. I don't know why we'd want to leave. Uh, maybe, maybe it's, <laughs> when you're putting in this weather, maybe that's a good reason to leave, if nothing else. So he's got his reason for wanting to leave. Top scorer in Holland two seasons ago, top scorer in Scotland last season. You're thinking, that's a, that's a fantastic achievement. Mm-hmm. You know, and in, and, in, and in the modern world, or in the modern transfer market, you think he'll, he'll go for a lot of money. Why is he not going for a lot of money? Subplot. Don't know. Why does he want to leave? Because it seems as if he enjoys himself at Celtic Park. He's doing mm-hmm. well. Does he go with the manager? Who knows? So again, we're we're not in the know. We're having this kind of a, you know, uninformed opinions about the whole thing. Uh, I hope he stays. I've always said I hope he stays. I think he's a kind of nice big guy. He puts himself about. He plays for the team. He's really unselfish. I think he's more skillful than people think he is. There's been sometimes he's done some things and whoa, that's pretty good for it. For a big guy, Bringing the ball down, putting a pass, moving, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I'd like to keep him, and it'd be interesting to know why. Why he leaves? Should he leave? It'd be interesting to know why, and we'll never know that. Chances are. So, again, these are things in football that we never get to get to know about. If he leaves, then we have to have another physical centre forward in there. Ideally, two. But then again, if you get two people coming in, how much game time is a second guy going to get? But. If we want to win the league, we need a big centre forward to give us something different. And I think as the pitches get worse, and they are bad just now, that's essential to me. Yeah, I think it's a really good point. Jim, let me go over here for a moment, because from time to time here at the studio, we get nice little gifts. People send us things. I love all that. And today, this will appeal, this will appeal to you, Jim, was a little bundle of these bad boys. Not All the right. view, the Celtic yep. fanzines from back in the late 80s and early 90s. Thank you very much to uh, one of our avid listeners who sent them in along, Brian, with a little bag of dime bars. He knows me too well. He knows me far too well. Now, the reason I'm bringing that up is obviously because we've got Brian McLaren in Glasgow tonight. Uh, 
We've got the Love Street jersey behind us. That in itself, you can't see, but it's actually signed by Danny McGrain. We're going to get Brian McClare to sign it right there as well. That will be the uh, prize draw giveaway tonight. So if you come along, you already um, are entitled to go and get a raffle ticket from the stall. You can buy a couple of others if you wish. Go in for the draw. Brian McClare will sign that for you. But part of my research was I'm looking at a lot of Brian's games for Celtic, right? And obviously he signed in 83 and he left in 87. He was a top goal scorer in all four of the seasons that he played. But football was completely different back then, Jim. Honestly, you're talking about often whereby, you know, you've got to adapt to your, your playing surface. The surfaces were shocking back then. Some of the goals McClure scores, it doesn't matter that it goes in and off his knee, his thigh. I'm not sure what the kind of tactics were when you watch the games. Um, but one of the things that I, I loved, and um, I can't wait for a player to bring this back, just about every time McClure scores a goal, right, he runs in into the net, grabs the ball under the arm, back to the centre circle gym. <laughs> One mm. of the things I miss about the old school football, but I tell you what, it was a different game back then, Jim, and something you you will be aware of, the crowds weren't that great, unless you were playing Aberdeen, maybe Rangers, possibly Dundee United. The crowds were sparse mm. all around Celtic Park. Uh, what's your yeah. memories of that era? Uh, the team of the early 80s was, was kind of my, my kind of favourite team, the kind of... Roy Aitken is, was one of my favourite Celtic players, and I think he's he was kind of hard done too. Because I think in a, in a different world, Roy Aitken becomes the manager after Billy McNeil because Jock Steen begats Billy McNeil, Billy McNeil begats Roy Aitken, and and he was such a big influential figure at that time. Uh, obviously, played in the same team as McClare. Uh, yeah, completely different environment. I mean, it was all about. The, I mean, most of the time the goalkeepers would kick the ball up the park. Mm -hmm. Looking for a centre four to get hold of it, play it wide. The winger takes somebody on, crossing out the box. It was a, a much more simple uh, game then, and that's why. I mean, the stats are great, but as I've said before, it's becoming very much like chess. And uh, when you read some of the some of the reports in games from a more kind of statistical point of view, you're thinking, I don't understand this. <laughs> you know, it's just it's just too too just too hard to, to understand what's happening. It was a simpler game. And you go back to the 20s and the 30s. Not that I was there in the 20s and 30s. You go back to the 20s and the, and the 30s and watch the games then. And I always recall watching the Mulder Sons 35 now, I think it was. And I remember the show before each game, the game this season, that was in the... Uh, for older... For, 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 sorry, for younger listeners. Uh, the season we went at Love Street to win the league, about four, four or five games before that, we go to Ibrox. And we're two up and we get a man sent off and all of a sudden we're fourth three down and Murdo equalises with about 10 minutes to go and that point was vital that point was absolutely vital because when you go to Love Street in the last day of the season we hadn't got that point we'd lost the league so that was a vital point mm -hmm. and the four each game it was bucketing down and it was looked upon as a classic one of the classic old firm games as it was at the time and my son at the time was showing and he was about 9 or 10 and he was laughing at it and he was saying look at that defending that's rubbish. And just, just, just completely slaughtered the game. And you're thinking, oh, look, this is, this is a classic. Look at this. And the goals were awful. And the, the mistakes people were making. He said, this is, this is just rubbish. And you're thinking, no, it's not. This is a classic. So I'm sure in 50 years' time, people look back at the game today and thinking, that was rubbish. You know, because goodness knows what it would be like in 50 years' time. But uh, it will certainly be different. In terms of the numbers that went to the games, you know, having a season ticket was, it was an unusual thing. You know, people didn't have to. And in most cases, it wasn't worth having a season ticket. There was no advantages of having a season ticket. The board didn't want you to have a season ticket. And I don't know what point, but there was, a, there was some point where you had to go to the, was it was it, was it the chairman's office for him to vet you, <laughs> to make sure you get a season. I don't know when, this, it was up to maybe the early 70s. You want the season, you have to go to see somebody to say, am I, am I worthy? Suitable. Are you suitable? Wow. Am I, am I worthy? to get a season ticket so yeah and then obviously there was very few seats back in the day people stood people would walk from one end of the ground to the other end of the ground and, and this must sound bizarre to anyone under the age of you know 35 or so that, that mm -hmm. this was what things were like back in the day but, but back in the day or back in the 80s so that was a question you were asking great team McGarvey, McClare 
McCluskey, Nicholas Aitken, Proven, McLeod, etc., etc. Right. And that was the, that was the season when when you said he left in eighty seven. He left. Morris Johnson left. Alan McInerney left. Murdo McLeod left. So so four of the best players mm-hmm. left at the start of the centenary season, and that's why we weren't that confident with the centenary season. And obviously, as soon as it came in the year before, he was spending a fortune. But we turned around, and then everything fell flat for the next nine years. But hey ho. Yeah, I love it. But Jim, you're absolutely <clears throat> right. When you watch the games, Brian, right? And Frank McGarvey goes on a mazy run and does something. God bless him, by the way. Um, you think to yourself, nobody told him to do that. You know, that that isn't part of the plan. It, it definitely wasn't part of the plan. Then McLear would pop up and do something. You were thinking, what's he doing there? It was a simpler game in many, many respects. But I do still enjoy watching it. I really, really do. And it reminded me just how in amazing um, and immense Paul McStay was once again in that era. Absolutely phenomenal. And if you're coming along to Gracie's, we're going to have the, the uh, images of all these games beamed up on the big screen for you coming in. Now, listen, you're talking about people under the age of 35. Jim, Kyogo Furuhashi today turns 28 28 years young is Kyogo. We're going to be talking about him. He is the first choice. And he was born, obviously, on the 20th of January. Now, on the 21st of January, the following day, uh, the day after Kyogo was born, Celtic went to uh, Fur Hill and drew nothing each. Uh, so that's how inspiring Celtic were back then. That was the ill-fated Hamden season, 94-95. Jim, you'll remember that well. Oh, so I don't know if you well. know it's today, Paul. This is also the anniversary of the Tenet Sixes. Oh, ninety-two. Oh, the win. The win, I the Saint jo- when we beat St. Johnston. Oh, four-two. Wow. I mean, that was huge. That was absolutely massive at the time. It was, massive, it was. and that's how yeah. that's how bad we were. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, I remember Cascarino scoring a goal in the final. Outrageous days, outrageous times. Um, but Kyogo, let's talk about him, Brian, because um, Ange made the comment during the week about how people had been going on about him going off the boil. And Ange basically said, well, he's been pretty consistent. He's been on it since he got here. I think that's pretty fair comment. I know that we look at every nuance, every performance in every game, every missed chance. But I don't think we've gone through a spell where you think, oh, Kyogo needs dropped. He's he's lost it. Really? Do you? <clears throat> Not particularly. There were a couple of games where I thought Yakimaki should have started. I thought that... and it, So the argument of what his Kyogo, Kyogo had a dip... I think they, what Andrew said, what people said as well, he's been scoring. And it's like, well, I has been scoring, but it's because he's a, a very good player. But if he was playing to his maximum, he might have scored more. Do you know what I mean? So it's, it's all relative. So, you know, we're used to Kugo, you know, insane movement, class touches, incredible goals. But we've also seen a kind of wasteful side of him. And yeah, he's been scoring goals, but he had been missing chances. No, the whole season, obviously. He just went through, he did go through a spell. I think that's undeniable. I mean, look, in Europe, we never scored once. Mm-hmm. So if you're going to tell me that's a striker that's been on form on season, I'm going to have to say no, regardless of the levels he's at. Um, but I mean, I don't think anyone said Kyogo's garbage, sell him, drop him. I think it's just every player, every player ever, Messi will have dips in form. That's all right. What is the, the, the famous cliched phrase? That class is permanent, form is temporary. And I think you saw with Kyogo's finish, um, that, that, that was exceptional. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there's no doubt he's an incredible footballer. But I think people can get a bit defensive when you question people's form. I mean, I, I, I don't know so much I, I, I rate Matt O'Reilly, and I thought he could do a risk. I thought he was off the boil a wee bit. He wasn't necessarily playing bad, but given the standards he set, mm-hmm. he wasn't quite meeting him. I think the same is true with Kyogo. Um, again, I don't think anyone was saying that Kyogo's done garbage overnight and he should be, should be binned or any of that nonsense. But I think it's fair to call out if, if there's players no playing to the potential they've shown. But thankfully, like most players, he's over that dip in form and it looks like he's, you know, the past few weeks, it looks like he's getting back to the, the AQ goal we, we, we sort of know and love. And I just don't think that you can necessarily say, it sounds stupid to say, but I just think just scoring and goals sometimes isn't enough to justify being in top form. I think you can always be a wee bit better for him. Yeah, I mean... There's no doubt, Jim, that when Kyogo came to Celtic, uh, we got our first glimpse of him uh, the same night that, that Starfelt made his debut at Tynecastle. He comes on as a sub that night. Um, mm-hmm. And very quickly, 
we realised that he was a completely different type of player. I mean, I always remember him kind of hanging on the shoulder of the last defender, beating the offside trap. He's been penalised quite a few times where we, uh, you know, whiskers uh, between him and being offside and VAR has penalised him a few times. But over the piece, um, there has been some suggestion from time to time this season, Jim, that he should be dropped. Um, was that ever in your mind or, or, or have you been pretty keen and pretty confident that he has been the number one throughout? And really, that the knock-on effect to that is a discussion we've already had about Yakimakis perhaps being un, unhappy with the lack of game thing. I think under Ange, then, everyone can be, can be left out of the team. I don't think that's an issue. I think uh, one of the advantages of having such a strong squad is you get top-class players who can come on. It's different if... Uh, if we had a bench full of young guys, and you would say, well, you have to keep playing Kyogo all the time, no matter what. But if you get someone like Yakimakis, champing it a bit, waiting to go, and, and if Kyogo's not playing to the levels he's meant to be playing, or he, the, the, so that he can play at, then you have to you know, leave him at the team. Uh, I find it interesting. I mean, he's, he's, he's such a... He, he tends to miss a lot of chances, you know, and, 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 you, and I don't want to be too unfair, because he scores a lot of great goals. Uh Comparing him to Yakimakis, I think Yakimakis maybe does more for the team. You know, there's certain games where you want the ball held up, you want, to, you know, uh, a bit of physicality in both boxes, etc. So, obviously, Yakimakis does that. But in, in terms of his finishing, his finishing is outstanding. And there's been some key moments. I think if you go back to the League Cup final last year, if it's not for, if it's not for Kyogo, we don't win the game. Mm -hmm. We haven't played particularly well in that game. That's another thing about, I mean, that's... That's a few times we've played at Hamden under Ange. We haven't played particularly well in any of the games. I mean, that's a bit of a concern for the final. Yeah, St. Johnston, St. Johnston last season as well, Jim. Cup, a late yeah. goal with James Forrest, and then mm -hmm. the final, Hibs had scored. They were looking a bit sticky, and then Kyogo bang, bang, we won the game. Scottish Cup semi-final last year, really, really poor. And then last week, I mean, obviously, you know, the pitch was horrible, and it was, you know, rain, wind, et cetera, et cetera, but weren't they that good? When I say not that good, not that good compared to the standards of that we've set, not that good. So that's a big concern for me. In terms of the creation, uh, he's a fantastic player. The goals he scored speak for themselves. He can be a bit more clinical at times, but if you've got a really good squad, that's the whole point of having a good squad. Is that somebody just goes off the boil a wee bit, off, and we'll get this new guy on. It's up to him to keep the jersey, and that's a good thing to have. Yes, it is. I'm just looking at his record at the moment. Uh, 61 appearances for Celtic. Not all of them were starts, and he has scored 38 goals. It's a phenomenal record, uh, and I know that the data the data guys um, look at the minutes played, but he, he has had a tremendous return, and some of the goals have been sublime, like the one uh, uh, just the other night there. Absolutely tremendous finish. But Hatati's pass as well, Brian. Unbelievable pass by Hatati, and, and that's a player, and I know that we, we really have spoken long and hard about him. He came in and made a really an instant impact in the team um, and we knew that he was tired, he needed a rest, he spoke about that at the end of the season, both physically and mentally, he needed time off, he got that we were disappointed for him not getting into the World Cup squad but you know what, he probably needed the rest anyway and he definitely has um, physically transformed from last season when you look at him, he, he's completely changed and we're, we're constantly reminded this is only his third season in senior football which is astonishing when you look at how he plays. I mean, the way that he plays the game is like a veteran to the point the other, the other day there where he's taken off and he's not happy. And Matt O'Reilly's Matt standing, hanging, waiting for him to, to get a wee, uh, a wee shake of the hand or something, a wee fist punch, anything. And, um, you know, he's, he's that unhappy that he just kind of trudges off. I think um, at the beginning of the season, I said Hattati is going to be the main man. By the way, there's been quite a few people um, up against them for that, but I do think that you know, performance wise, he's been sensational so far. Absolutely, I remember when he, I think I'd said when he debuted, it was one of the best debuts I'd, I'd seen when I said for a new signing. I thought it was excellent. It just, you know, also got a crack goal, his movement and stuff. And I've also said that I think he's a wee bit inconsistent during games. That you know, there is things he does things, and you think, oh, that's a you know. You should nail it. It's a five yard pass and it's going to rain. And then there's times where he does these like insane passes, like the one for Kyogo's goal. And you saw a few in Europe as well. He's such a clever player. And I think he's such an ambitious player in that he's willing to try something that maybe other players won't. Mm -hmm. And that's why I've always said I think he's one of those guys that's hard to drop, even if he flutters in and out of games at times, because he's always got something that just 
I mean, you saw, I think it was, was it Dundee United? And I don't think we were playing that well. And Hitati in the second half just took the game by the scruff of the neck and refused to lose. And he just drove the team on. I hadn't really seen that from him before. Mm-hmm. But that's why you have him in the park because he can just produce something at the blue. Um, I think he's exceptional. And the fact that it's only his third year is, 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 is crazy. Um, but yeah, you talk about his physicality as well. He's, he's very strong, very robust. He, mm-hmm. He's not intimidated by the, the, the roughhousing tactics that, you know, people try to employ. And neither Kyogo, to be fair. I mean, Kyogo's not particularly physically robust, but he never backs out. I mean, he challenges, he, he jumps in, he's, he's no scared. He's got a real, real good spirit. I think Hitati's the same. I think he's a real, real excellent player. And I think actually he's, you know, generally you tell on about, you know, you can really tell tactics for before and stuff in, in other games. But as you look at Angie's team, it's very much a system. It's very much a specific way. And I think as players get better on that as well, Hitati's getting a bit more comfortable knowing where players are going to be. Mm-hmm. I think there's just times maybe if, because we change the front three so often, sometimes those passes are a wee bit awry, but he just shifts his brain and then finds Kyogo with an absolutely... I mean, that, that goal in general was wonderful. It, it's some of my favourite goals under Ange, just that quick counter. You know, we're under pressure, banks a goal. Like, you know, we talked about Hamden, the league cup against Hibs. Mm-hmm. You know, it was um, like 38 seconds or some ridiculous thing after Hibs equalising and then Kyogo bang. Another lob as well, by the way. Um, yeah, so exceptional stuff and a, a very clever footballer and it must be a real pleasure for, for guys to play in a team like that. You know, the, the, the thing as well that Liam uh, brings to the party, Jim, is the insight into Japanese football, actually from kind of academy level, how players are taught from, you know, youth level. And he talks about this versatility, the adaptability, whereby, you know, they, they do expect players to have at least a couple of positions, sometimes three positions that they can fill. And and, and I think we're benefit well, the Japanese players have benefited from that. You know, Kyogo, Maeda and Hatati even filling in at right back. There was even a suggestion that if he was needed to fill in at left back, he could do that as well. Um, and, you know, we're all about the culture of that game. Um, but there is one player that keeps coming to my mind and it's, Idiguchi. And I think to myself, well, he came in and has barely played. Would it not have been better, Jim? Because everybody seems quite happy to write him off. You know, you can go back to Japan. I think Grandpa Say are interested. Would it not have been better just to loan him out and get him into a Scottish side so that he can get to grips with a Scottish game and play more minutes? Would that not have been a better option, Jim? Before answering that, go back to Hatati. I said this a few weeks ago. Hatati's a risk taker and mm. I love risk takers. That's where you go and watch people for people who take risks. Because if you play safe all the time, it's not worth watching. And I think he's a he's easily the best player this season. And not that any known Celtic fans will watch it, but see if you keep him quiet, you will allow me to keep Celtic quiet. Because a lot of the times our moves get down that left hand side and he's the guy that's moving across there. So it's, it's Taylor or Staff or something, they're looking for Hitati. He's the guy that picks the ball up just inside the opposition half and he starts making things happen. So He's a, he's, a, he's a fantastic player, a uh, brilliant player. Uh, the Gucci uh, got a horrendous injury, uh, obviously Aloha, and that's my, that's my only concern about the game tomorrow, no more injuries, because that was that's basically finished, potentially finished his, his, uh, his time in Scotland, uh, the Gucci. Said before, it'd be good to loan players out, but it has to be a team that wants to take him. So yeah. if there was a team to take him, fine. And if, they did, if, if he went somewhere, then it'd be good to play in the top league here so he gets a feel for what it's like I think that's unfortunate but that's the nature of football football's very fickle you know one one bad tackle and who knows that he might have been as good as the other Japanese players that are here but you know, <coughs> that's just your luck at the end of the day so if there was an opportunity to loan the guy out yeah because then, because we haven't actually seen what he's like uh, I think it's unfair but he holds that football at times I think Ange is pretty ruthless at the end of the day and we've got a big squad as it is so he has to kind of pick and choose who he keeps, who he moves on. But the fact he signed him in the first place means he must have rated the guy. And it'd be good to see him get a bit of time somewhere before we eventually cut loose, if in fact that's what Andy's thinking. But again, who knows what Andy's thinking? Maybe he's just waiting for the opportunity. Hopefully, maybe he gets a chance to play tomorrow. See the interesting to play. thing on the, the loan situation? So I, I, I'm not opposed to loans, obviously. I think they can be really good. But I don't know that sending had Edigucci to spend a season under Derek McInnes at Comarnock sitting behind the ball would really tell you how he's going to play in Andy's system or what he can do creatively or what he can do I think it depends on the player 
I think that's why, like, the likes of Mikey Johnson was loaned out to the Portuguese team mm. because the, the expansive football is a bit more similar and maybe the standard. So I think maybe a loan would be good, but I don't think anyone in Scotland is going to really hugely benefit. It's different. I think maybe like a goalkeeper, like if uh, Ola Emi was going out on loan, I think a Scottish team might be good because he's dealing with the physical strikers, he's more chances to develop his goalkeeping. But even then, he has to be a team with a plan out for the back or it's a waste of time. So I think loans are, are, are good. I think you could, we could have a full debate on how successful they've been for Celtic, but I don't think necessarily loan to Scotland is going to benefit anyone in this team particularly. Um, and I think that's why, I mean, there's been a few players we've saw since Andrew's come in we've thought they could, they could be decent. Mm. But you never quite tell how they're going to leap and Andrew also doesn't fancy it. So it'd be interesting to see how that develops. But for me, I want to Scotland and Scottish team. I, I'm going to be convinced it's going to be great. I've always thought... I think that's a valid point, Brian, but I think also the fact that it's such a physical game here, even mm. if he's playing for somebody else, to get used to that kind of type of game. Because mm. the young centre-half the other night who, who, who had a good debut, I thought, but he looks kind of slight, a wee bit slight to me. You know, so I think it'll be interesting to see what he's like when he's maybe challenged with more f- physicality. So I think if you've, if you've got a chance to play in Scotland, maybe, you know, and, and all the points you make are completely valid, but maybe it gives you some sort of feel for this is what this league's like. I need to be tougher here. I need mm-hmm. to do certain things, you know, so a bit of a balance in that. I think it, yeah. depends on, it probably depends on the position then, doesn't it? Yeah. Like, I mean, if you're a really creative player, it's maybe not ideal, but maybe, as you say, it was actually a goalkeeper, maybe defender. You might find that that level of robustness is better. Um, so yeah, I suppose it depends. Then yep. again, it's about, it's about trying to find the team. So if, if there was another team in Scotland who who could use him in the in the area of the pitch that he plays, then that'd be ideal. But if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. So. Yeah, I think environment wise, it would be good so that they can adapt to the environment. Um, but I totally yeah. get what you mean, Brian, with regards to the system that Ange plays. It's a very unique system, certainly in Scotland. Um, And I always felt that, you know, when we had a decent relationship with the manager, when the managers left the club, um, why we couldn't continue that relationship with a view to having some kind of partnership with them. I thought Ronnie Dyla was a prime example. Uh, Ronnie goes back to Norway. It would have been great to get a couple of the guys over there, season on season, if it worked for both clubs. And then sometimes people make the argument about uh, financial elements and oh maybe they can't afford it listen as long as the club who is loaning the player in pays any of the wages they can have that player so Celtic have got a decision to make does the player not play games and we pay him his wages or does the player play games and we pay him his wages minus one pound because that was some of the deals that were happening in Scottish football now I don't know if the minimum amount has been changed but there were certainly players in the past being loaned to Dunfermline Athletic and the pars were paying one pound of their wages, so the, the wage thing really isn't an issue. It's all about getting game time in the players' legs. I actually don't think he's got a future at Celtic, which is very unfortunate. But the other side of that, in, in terms of the loans, is you're kind of delaying the inevitable. So at the end of the season, we've got quite a lot of guys coming back that you know, Ayeti and Barkas and Sorrow and some people that you might have forgotten about. They're coming back. Um, and hopefully we can get some deals done for those players as well. A couple of more comments coming in. Um, Celtic follower, ideally if we can acquire O as our third striker, gives us all we need. If Yakamakis goes, then South Korean is ideally placed to sway his friend and fellow countryman Cho to join him. Well, we don't, as Jim's already says, we don't really know the ins and outs of a lot of the interest or otherwise. What is sheer speculation? Um, You know, deals that some of the Scottish media are saying they're coming from the Japanese media. We speak to Liam. Liam says it's not come from the Japanese media. They're quoting the Scottish media. So it's a, a total, um, it's a system of basically gossip and uh, smoke and mirrors. You and boy, mirror, mirror, Martin. Hail, hail troops, just getting ready to get the ferry across the Clyde and on my way to Glasgow for tonight's Axon gig. We've got the Ardoyne boys coming over as well. It's going to be a fantastic night and I'm really looking forward to it. And I've got to say, by the way, I've been pitching it as a live event like no other, and it is. It's not just sitting down, q and It's not that at all, so be prepared. Anyway. You're standing uh, up. Yeah. You're standing up. There's no seats. Um, Brian McClare, a QA and a with Brian McClare is different anyway. Uh, but, you know, I've seen reports in the week there, and it was Brian McClare, unrecognisable. You show me anybody 
and compare it to a picture 35 years ago. And you're going mm. to have changed quite dramatically. Okay, so he grew a beard during the lockdown, but I thought that was about OTT, Brian. Did you see the headlines? I, I try to avoid stuff like that. Like, I mean, you know, I mean, if you look at me 35 years ago, I was four. Um, sadly, I'm still about the same height, which is a problem, but mm. that's just my issues. Um, I, I mean, it's just unrecognised players and look at the state. I, I hate stuff like that in general. It's no... You know, you see it with the celebrities. Look at a celebrity now. And it's like, well, I think it's older, a bit fatter, changes the look. What are you worried about? <laughs> Do you know what the important thing is? You are a top class football player and, and a good guy. You know, that's, that's more important. So uh, it's, not, it's not something to pay too much attention to, if I'm honest. Nah, nah, he's a top, top guy. But Jim, you know, time stands still for no one. I can vouch for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think Chalky's in what he must be in his mid fifties now. So, so in his mid fifties, looks a bit different from his mid twenties. Uh, well, short horror, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. I know, I know. I, I think it was a bit cruel, actually. Danielle, welcome back to the show. It's good to see you. With Ange signing so many good players, it's imperative we get rid of the dead. We were just kind of talking about that. Utrecht fans are dying to sign Barkas. Can you imagine that? What was your nickname for him, Brian? But oh, can't afford. Ones. Yes, can't afford more than three million. I'd let him go for that oh, in a heartbeat. In a heartbeat, I'd let him go for that. I'd let him go for a million. I'd let a jetty go for a million as well. We just need it's the legacy issues. They're not Angie's, you know, problems anymore. And we just need to move them on. And by the way, I, I know I'm talking about them as if they're just uh, chess pieces or commodity. But and I, I do respect that. Obviously, we're talking about footballers here. But in terms of Celtic, yeah, I do agree, Daniel. We need to get them moved on. There's no doubt about it. I'm going to come to yourself, Jim. I'm not picking on you today, by the way, but obviously. Um, you will have remembered Morton as a Premier League club, um, mm -hmm. you know, through the ages, some cracking players, some cracking yep. games done at Capolo. Yeah. Um, for a number of seasons, they've been out of the top division in Scotland, but we have drawn them at Celtic Park. Um, and by the way, fair play to them. They've sold over 2,000 tickets. And I was reading this Brilliant. morning, that's yep. the best travelling support at Celtic Park since 2019. Um, what do you make of the uh, potential changes in the lineup? What would you do if you were... Big Ange on Saturday. Are you playing it safe? Uh, I always say play your best team, but play the best team in the league. Uh, the Cups, I've said before, we're not that first about uh, uh, like to win, but if, if we don't win, I mean, we're playing Morton and, and the squad that we've got, I mean, if you can't put, with no disrespect to Morton, but if you can't put out uh, a team of, of, of guys who are not getting their games and take care of Morton, then there's something wrong somewhere. Uh, Ideally, I'd always keep the spine in my team, but I think the guys in the spine need a rest. By the spine, I'm thinking Joe Hart, Carter Vickers, Cal Mack, Kyogo. So normally you would say we'll change everything else, but I think those guys could 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 do a rest. Uh, anyone who's not had game time, I would give them game time. Eddie Gucci, it's a perfect example. I'd bring him in as well. Maybe have a couple of, well, have some of the bigger guns on the bench, just in case. Mm. Uh, couple of B team lads maybe on the bench. And if we are playing well and a, a few goes up, we're good to maybe see a few of the B team guys on. No disrespect to Morton again. Uh also, I mean, historically we've we've kind of had the odd kind of game against lower opposition at Celtic Park in the in the kind of first round of the cup that's kind of been a bit sticky. Mm. So no guarantees, but I mean I looked this morning, Morton, like in the mid table. In the championship, they haven't won a game since mid-November. You know, so I mean, again, no disrespect to Morton, but you know, we should win the game quite convincingly tomorrow, and we should make quite a few changes. And I think Cal Mack could do with a rest if Carter Vickers isn't 100 percent Leave him out. Yeah, look, give give Joe Hart a rest. Love to see Yakimakis play because that might maybe mean he's he's going to stay. Don't know, but yeah, I'd make lots of changes tomorrow. These are the games to give players a chance because in the past. We've been on here and people have said it's time to give such and such a game. My view's always been, no, he's not in what I would call the best team, so he can't he play. Tomorrow, you don't have to play the best team, so don't play the best team. Make lots of changes and they, they should be more than good enough to take care of Morton. Yeah, yeah, they should be. I mean, we, we've been talking, since Ange came in and started building this side, Brian, we've been talking about having two, sometimes three players in every position. Um, but it, it's not just about filling jerseys, is it? It's about knowing that you can call on the second choice or even the third choice and they can go out and get the result for you. Um, and I know that some of the players you would think are maybe risky in a crunch game in the league, 
Um, this is a very important tie, but I do think that you can approach it in such a way that uh, some of the more fringe players can get game time. And I think, you know, there are other players as well that I would like to see getting that game time. Haksabanovic, for example, you know, coming back from injury, I'd like to see him getting minutes. And the other one I'm going to throw into the mix, simply because we, we talked about his goal and um, the celebration, is David Turnbull. And he's a player who is kind of struggling for minutes at the moment. And I think we need to try and get these guys, you know, involved when we possibly can. Yeah, I couldn't agree more about Turnbull. He's a guy that I think that my opinion's always been, I think he's an excellent player. I really, really rate him highly. I just think he maybe lacks the sort of dynamic movement that Angie's midfield requires at times. Um, but there's no reason he shouldn't start tomorrow. I agree about Haksmanovic as well. We action Manovic. I like how many plays. I think he's a, a really good player. Um, what would be interesting to see, I think I'd probably keep the... So I'd start Ralston as well. Mm-hmm. So I've missed yeah, yeah. Yep. These are games that are ideal for him. Mm-hmm. I think he can feel hard done by that he's maybe not played as much because I think he always gives a, a really, really strong performance. I think Starfield and Kobayashi, I would keep in place. I thought um, Kobayashi looked pretty solid, pretty composed. Um, I'd have Burnaby at left back because then, you know, Ralston gives you that sort of more defensive right back. Be anyway more attacking, so the balance is quite nice. Um, interesting that uh, Juranovic started at left back ahead of him. Yeah, yeah. I know that's a concern or not. Um, midfield, I'd like to see Iwata starting, see what he can do. And again, we bit of baptism with fire. Yeah, they might not be the standard of the team, but that physicality Jim was talking about, it's good to get in there and get involved, see what he can offer. Mm-hmm. Turnbull, Moy would probably start. Um, and Yakimakis, I would also start. Um, Haksabanovic and then probably Forrest on the other side. Just you guys that maybe don't play all the time. But I mean, that, that team I've named would comfortably beat anybody in the Championship and probably most teams in Scotland. So I shouldn't be any fear about that. No, what you're right. to see is a guy like maybe a Joey Dawson being on the bench or a Vata again. You know, if, if we're, we're three, and, three and up in the first half, there's no reason these guys kind of got to be tasty. People say, oh, it's a big league for the Lowland League. To the Premier League, and I get it, but you're playing with Premier League players in a system that is very, very um, sort of self functional. So if you're Joey Dawson and you've got these guys playing balls into you, it's a good chance to show you what you can do. So uh, if a few goes up, he could come on, Vata could come on, and then maybe, you know, give you all again 15 minutes at the end. I don't see any reason why not um, if the game's going really well. As well as also, that, I think Ryan. just sorry. Just to just to and I think also the most important thing tomorrow is nobody gets hurt, no injuries. But because uh, that's what I said earlier about, about, about the spine of the team, if, if, if any of that spine get injured of the, of the team, I think that would have big implications for the league. And that was the thing about Aloha last uh, season that, that the injury that, that Carl McGregor got that could have kept him out for the whole season. And I kind of, you know, first round Scottish Cup tie is not that important. So if if one of the big guns were to get injured tomorrow, I think people would say, hey, Ange, why'd you play him? You know, if it was, you know, again, if it was one of the spine of the team, why did you play him? So so I think it's a difficult kind of, kind of balance night, but I think I would, I would leave the big guns on the bench. And if we're desperate, then, then we bring them on. But don't get injured. Please don't get injured tomorrow. Touch wood. No, definitely. Wood. The point, point Brian was making about Joey Dawson, I, I also think what that does, Brian, is it sends a signal to the B team. And it just says, if you're doing well, because he's been on a great run of form, if you're doing well, I'm going to reward you. You're going to make that progress. And I think that's important because there's a few guys like Vata and like Lowell who are probably at that point where they are itching to play first-team football. Maybe Ange doesn't think they're quite ready yet. But if you give them that wee taste, because we don't want... And I know that Ben Doak was a generational talent and, and he's kind of proven that since he left Celtic. But we don't want a repeat of that. There's been too many young guys at that stage of their development who have left Celtic because of this pathway uh, not being available to them. Far too many. There's a whole team of them, you know, and I think... I think Declan, when he asked Anja, but it was quite a... Yeah. It was a great question, but Deck, by the way, stood out, you know, even watching it is a, an excellent question, so well done, Deck. But I think um, Angie's response was good when he said, you know, 6 to 12 months will be like to get... His, so he's, all, he's also got it in mind. And you talk about sending a message to the academy players. It could send a message to some of the first-teamers as well. Mm-hmm. You know, there's these guys at your tails and they're not at your heels and they're desperate for time. You know, if you're not cutting it, it's not just the one other guy you need to compete with. You know, if, if 
so and so gets injured, it's not just automatic to you because there's a, a youngster ready to take your place and fight for every second. So, I mean, I always say, I think I think Greg Taylor's been probably our most consistent player. I think when we lost him against Rangers, it really altered the game. And I think part of that is the fact Burnley be coming. I really do. I think his attitude's always been good, but you really saw a massive improvement. And that kind of just be down to him. That's got to be thinking, wait a minute. If I get dropped here, there's somebody ready to come into my place. And if you look at Ralston, he's, I don't think he's performed badly at any point this season. No. And he's hardly played because Juranovic has been good. And I think Johnson's hit the ground running. So yeah, that competition is always good. And it should always be at a club of size of Celtic, regardless. Johnson can even take a throw and sitting down. It's tremendous. Tremendous. Now, top nine. Yep, Here's Gary. a bugbear from the other night. Sorry, just to put in again. The, the, the VAR thing was just ridiculous the other night. Uh, I know it's a bit of a tangent here, but the first half, two go. I mean, anytime somebody scores a goal, it takes at least a minute by the time they jump off the park and celebrate and come back to that point. There's a minute straight away. And each of the goals were, were VAR checked. So that's like two minutes for, for two goals. And the offside St. St. Smirin goal was VAR checked. So it's yeah. maybe four or five minutes. One minute injury time. That's just a complete nonsense. That's just yep. incompetence to me. Like, another thing just to mention, because you mentioned throw-ins. The St Mirren guy was taking those long throw-ins at least three times his foot's over the line. And he's standing beside the referee, the assistant referee. And I'm assuming if they'd have scored, VAR would have said, hold on, his foot's over the line. But at no point did they, did, they, did they pull the guy up. And one of my bugbears is that why do we not have somebody who can take long throws? Why doesn't every club have somebody who can take long throws? Have we ever had one, Jim? Because you I would think, think. That, that basically, I would think, thinking simplistically, that you get your squad together and you get the motivator long, you get the motivator throw in, and you think he's actually he's no bad at that. That's the challenge him. on the stage tonight. It's who can throw the ball the longest, Jim. You've absolutely. On it. That's what we're doing with chalk of the night. And then you can coach them to be better. Then you think well, actually you're no bad at that. We're going to coach you to be better than that. It just mystifies me why. But Jim, the, 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 the big it was the eight stroke that. Basically, it was like Stoke Secret Wetman on the Premier League member under, yeah. under Pulis. And it was, was the it? guy with his name. And every time he put the ball right into the box, oh, I it's you need to, you need to, somebody right to remind me in the comments, you know, it's a big giant guy who used to Aye. throw the ball on. But you're right, but, it's, it's like incremental advantages in it. There's Aye. a lot of extra bits that just make you better. Specialist Aye. coaching down, down south, specialist coaches, you know, for throw ins and set pieces. But Rory all, Dillard, perhaps I'm well done, Rory, Rory Dillard. Dillard. All Dillard, joking aside, course, the yeah. challenge tonight is, is the hardest shot. We're trying to find who's got the hardest shot from the list of Celtic legends that will be appearing at uh, Celtic State of Mind events throughout the year of 2023. There's a big scoreboard and everything. So, um, think right. back to Stig on top gear. And obviously people challenging them and the score goes up on the board. And we were doing it in the studio, which isn't that big. And a few things almost got smashed. Um, and the hardest shot yesterday, it's a one step, Jim. You only get one step up, no big run up. Mm -hmm. One step, strike, we've got the nets and everything all set up. The hardest shot yesterday was 53 miles per hour. So Brian McClare will be taking a challenge tonight. And if you're up for it, anybody in the crowd, one of you will be coming up on the stage to have a wee go at that as well. 53 miles an hour. Who had, who had the hard shot at Celtic? Murdo McLeod had a hard Murdo. shot at Celtic. Yeah, Murdo, Murdo was the rhino. Um, and I think other players like, you know, even Van Dyke. Van Dyke could strike a ball, you know. Um, but Van yeah, Hoydonk. Van Hoydonk. Van Hoydonk. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, we, might, yeah. we might have Van Hoydonk on the, on the stage at some point this year. and We'll, we'll see how hard he can kick a ball. Um, in relation to any of the other players who are going to be starting tomorrow, I know that Jim, you've had your um, your thoughts on Abada and his best his best position for some time. Before the game the other night, I was talking to Laura and I said Abada needs to make an impact, and he did. He did make an impact, but I want to see that on a more consistent basis, Jim. What's your thoughts where um, Abada is concerned this season? No, no me, no me. I I think he's a phenomenal. He just seems to score all these great goals. Not, not great. He seems to get himself into the position to score goals. And he's fantastic at that. And if if you play the ball ahead of him, he's got good pace to take players on. But see if you give him ball to feet, more often than not, he loses the ball. I don't know if the stats guys will back me up in that one, but you give him the ball to feet, he struggles. He looks for Tony. That was last year. It's worth yeah, Tony. Yeah, he does. Ball, yep. Tony. But put it ahead of him, let him run onto it, let him cut inside. He scores a hell of a lot of goals. Uh, but for me, as I've kept saying, he, he's not a winger. I think he just maybe plays off the front guy. Uh, but 
you can't argue with the number of goals that he scored and the impact that he's made. It's been phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. But again, he, he's not a winger in the kind of Yota mode where he'll take the ball and he's a close, good, good close skill, he can beat a man. And that's what I thought the other night when he brought in Forrest, the team at upper level, because he could take a man on. Mm -hmm. I thought, anyway, I mean, he's, a, he's a fantastic player, a bad I'll kind of leave it at that. No, you're right. He does. He does like playing with, with uh, Ralston. There's a real good dynamic when they're together, mm -hmm. uh, Brian. And I, actually, when I'm looking at my starting lineup tomorrow, I'd probably start both of them uh, down the right hand side. And on the left, you mentioned Bernabe. If we're playing him, I think you've got to play Maeda in front of him because defensively he needs a wee bit of backup. But I would like to see the central defensive partnership remaining as it was the other night. Um, and then you know the rest of the, I think the rest of the kind of forward line. And the midfield could could be any combination. Of I think he might play Welsh mentioned. tomorrow. I think he might play Welsh instead of Carl Starfield. I think he would maybe leave Starfield because I think again, unfair. He's had such a hard time. Starfield. I think he's a, he a, a better, good defender. Better than the, the, the right, I think. Mm -hmm. He's a. I he's a really good defender. He's not too clever with the ball at his feet. But again, I made the point about watching him at Hamden last week. Carl Starfield plays about eighty passes a game. And last week, the pitch is horrible and all this kind of stuff. And most of them kind of found their man. Maybe one or two didn't, and the fans go absolutely mad. But he who if you play that kind of football, sometimes you're not going to make that pass. And I just think he's such a good player. I wouldn't like, I wouldn't like him to get injured tomorrow. So I think they're going to be go, the new guy, who I, who I uh, and either Jens or, or, or Welsh. That's, that's the two I would go for. Brian smiling. He must have read Roy the Rovers, because I certainly did. And hot shot Hamish Balfour was one of my favourite uh, Storylines and comic strips in that magazine. Did he play for Celtic? Well, I'll tell you what, 53 miles per hour seems quick to me. I don't know. I think there was, uh, I did read someplace that I don't know how they did it. Uh, Tommy Gemmell's um, shot was 73 miles per hour. Uh, that was his shot. I don't know if they took a speed gun down to Barrafield one day and, and tried it, but yeah, one of the hottest shots in European football. Can we beat it tonight? It's just a one step up and you strike it into the net. Have you come to the gig? Put your hand up when I shout it out. You might be able to come up and challenge Chalky as well. Anybody who wants to ask questions of Brian McClare, all you need to do is tweet me at Paul John Dykes. Tweet your question to Brian McClare because at the end of the night, we will be putting audience questions and Axom audience questions to Chalky. Um, all that's left for me to say is thanks, everybody, for getting involved. Loads of brilliant comments coming through, um, as always, and I hope to see some of you tonight. If you haven't done so already, make sure to get your tickets for Bend It Like Bertie. Um, and also, if you want to come and see us with Danny McGrain uh, at Gracie's, the tickets are in the link underneath the video. Give us a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and thank you once again, Brian Degnan and Jim Moore, for joining me on a Celtic State of Mind.